What's up, Night Owls? Steely here back with another video, and today I'm going to be helping you decide what class to play in 5th edition D&D. Just like in any RPG, deciding what class to play will be the hardest decision you make because it'll have such a huge impact on how you play the game. So it's my hope that this video will kind of guide you in the right direction by giving you a brief description of each class. I do plan on doing a video for each class separately that'll go over more in-depth things. So this video is just going to give you a brief overview just to help you decide what to play. So to start things off, I'm going to talk about the four easiest classes to play. I say this because they have little to no magic and they're pretty straightforward in how to use them. Barbarian, Rogue, Fighter, Monk. Barbarians are defined by their rage ability. Rage gives them this increased burst of strength and they can shrug off damage. The damage bonus that you get from raging is strictly for melee weapons. Combine that with their damage resistance and you have an amazing frontline fighter, but they have very little benefit at a range. Barbarians get a special armor bonus when they're not wearing actual armor and they have the largest health pool of any other class. A level one raging barbarian also hits harder than any other class at level one and could drop most classes at level one with a single hit. Go with barbarian if you wanna be a raging brute. Fighters have a similar play style to barbarians, but they're much more versatile. They can choose from a variety of different weapons, making their approach to combat much more fluid than the Barbarian. And they're not just limited to melee weapons like the Barbarian is, they can also use ranged weapons. They can also use all types of armor, including heavy armor, making them much more dependent on magic items at higher levels, as that will determine just how strong they are. Whereas most classes get more powerful as they level up and get new spells and abilities, this is true for the fighter, but they get much more power spikes out of the gear they're carrying. Fighter's the way to go if you want to be more tactical about combat. Monks are characterized by their martial arts and their key energy. Martial arts are special benefits that monks get when they're using their fist or special monk weapons like nunchucks and bow staff. Their key energy is this mystical energy that monks can spend to do special effects like flurry of blows, which gives you two extra attacks on top of your regular attack. Monks also get to choose a path which gives them more specialized features like way of the shadow makes you more like a ninja. Way of the Four Elements makes you more like a bender from Avatar. Play a monk if you want to bounce all over the battlefield, kicking and punching people to death. Next is the rogue. Rogues hide in the shadows and wait for the right opportunity to strike. Rogues get a special feature called Sneak Attack, which gives them extra damage dice that scales with their level whenever they catch an opponent off guard. Rogue is the way to go if you want to be an assassin or a thief and play that sneaky cloak and dagger type character. So that was it for the easy classes. These next two classes dabble a little bit in spells, but they're not entirely dependent on them. And that's the Paladin and the Ranger. Paladins are very similar to fighters in that they get access to all weapons and all armor, but a lot of their class features are more focused on melee weapons, like their smites, which lets them enchant their melee weapon and give it extra damage on a swing. Their spell list also has smites, which give them special effects when they hit. Paladins also have a feature called Lay on Hands, which gives them a pool of healing power that they can use to heal party members and they also have access to auras, which gives their party members around them a special buff. The ranger is all about surviving in the wilderness. At level one, they get a favorite enemy, which they get bonuses to track and to recall information about. And they also learn a language that's spoken by their favorite enemy. They also get a favorite terrain at level one, which gives them bonuses to movement and survival within their favorite terrain. Rangers are also the only class that get access to an animal companion. At level 3, a ranger can choose the Beastmaster archetype and they get access to an animal that will fight alongside them. Druids in 3.5 D&D had access to an animal companion at level 1. In 5th edition D&D, only rangers get the animal companion, and that's only if they choose the Beastmaster archetype. Sorry, druids. It's important to note that rangers are not exclusively a ranged class either. They do have access to melee fighting styles. Play a ranger if you want to be at home in the wilderness and if you want to guide your party through the wilds. Now on to the spellcasters. And let me be clear, I am not saying do not play a spellcaster as your first class. I am saying it is going to take more work because you have to learn how spells work. And it's going to take a little bit of extra effort. With that being said, these next six classes are entirely dependent on their spellcasting ability. And without it, they're nearly useless. Bard, Druid, Cleric, Warlock, Wizard, Sorcerer. Druids are all about nature magic and the elements. Starting at level 2, they can turn into animals. At higher levels, druids can summon elementals and animals to fight alongside them, and they can even control the weather. Bards inspire others with their voice and music. Think of them as sound mages. A bard can inspire party members, giving them combat benefits, and a bard can also charm enemies. They are a very strong support class and make a great addition to any party. Clerics, whew, clerics are one of my favorites. 
I love just how versatile a cleric is and how different one cleric can be from another. I don't think the cleric is the one that just runs around healing people. They can do that, but that's boring. A cleric acts as a conduit for a deity or a divine power. That's not to say that they go door to door asking, have you heard the good news? But rather a cleric acts as a representative of the deity that they worship in the world that they're in. You see, every deity has their own world that they are in charge of. And then there's the material world in the middle where everybody can kind of influence, but they can't just show up directly and start making things happen. Rather, they use clerics to influence the main material world. I could do a whole video on the planes and deities, and I probably will at some point, but for now, just know that a cleric acts as a representative of a god of your choice, and the DM might let you make your own if you so choose. Warlock is probably the easiest spellcaster to play because they have such a limited pool of spells to choose from, and their spells are all pretty straightforward. A warlock gets their spells by making a deal with an otherworldly patron. The difference between a cleric and their relationship to their deity and a warlock and their relationship with an otherworldly patron can be tricky to really pin down, but I think the best way to describe it is a cleric wants to serve their deity and is rewarded with power, whereas a warlock wants power and makes a deal with an otherworldly patron in order to get power. So a warlock isn't really interested in the patron's goals outside of the deal that they make to use the power. Sorcerers are another spellcaster with a limited spell pool. And where other spellcasters get their power from an outside force, sorcerers get their power from within. Whether that be from like a magical bloodline or exposure to a ley line, it's important to decide as you draw up your sorcerer where your innate power comes from. And while their spell pool is limited, they do have points that they can spend to modify their spells a specific way like giving it increased range or a bigger blast radius or more damage, things like that. And finally, the wizard, another personal favorite of mine. And I'd have to say the wizard is probably the hardest class to play. Wizards get their magic by learning and studying ancient tomes. A wizard actually keeps a spell book that they can copy spells from other spell books and use them later on in the adventures. This can cost you a lot of time and a lot of gold, and the DM has to put in a lot of effort to decide where you get your spells. Even if you can just go to the local magic store and buy a bunch of scrolls, you still have to spend the time and the gold in order to copy those scrolls to your spellbook. It's a very micromanagement class. And as you fill your spellbook with this enormous spell list, you have to decide each day when you prepare what spells you're going to need for that day. This can be a problem for a DM that wants to surprise the party with a creature because a wizard that doesn't know what they're up against has to just kind of prepare for anything. But not to worry though, because although I feel wizards are the hardest to play, I also think they are the most powerful. They start off pretty weak at the beginning, but as they level up and as they fill up their spell book, they can become absolute powerhouses. And that's it for the D&D core classes. There are classes in other books, but for this video, I just wanted to stick with the core so that new players didn't get too overwhelmed with decisions, at least more than they already are. And with that being said, I hope this video was helpful. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, you know how YouTube works. Hit those buttons, leave a comment down below. Let me know which class is your favorite or which class you're going to play in your first game. And as always, I'll see you at sundown.